Eugenics outlasted the Progressive Era. As late as 1928, there were 376 college courses devoted to eugenics. Those who promoted genetic determinism and eugenics were neither uneducated nor fringe cranks. Quite the contrary. Edward A. Ross, Francis A. Walker, and Richard T. Ely all had Ph.D.s from leading universities and were professors at leading universities. Edward A. Ross was the author of 28 books, whose sales were estimated at approximately half a million copies, and he was regarded as one of the founders of the profession of sociology in the United States. He held a Ph.D. in economics from Johns Hopkins University, and at various times, served as Secretary of the American Economic Association, as well as President of the American Sociological Association, and Head of the American Civil Liberties Union. Among the places where his articles appeared were the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Ross was in the mainstream of progressive intellectuals at the highest levels. He was a man of the left who had supported Eugene V. Debs in the 1894 Pullman strike and had advocated public ownership and regulation of public utilities. Active as a public intellectual in print and on the lecture circuit, Professor Ross referred to us liberals as people who speak up for public interests against powerful, selfish, private interests, and denounced those who disagreed with his views as unworthy, kept spokesmen for special interests, a mercenary core, as contrasted with us champions of the social welfare. Roscoe Pound credited Ross with setting him in the path the world is moving in. Ross praised the muckrakers of his day, and was also said to have been influential with progressive presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. The introduction to one of Ross's books included a letter of fulsome praise from T.R. The voters' repudiation of the progressives, in the years after the Woodrow Wilson presidency, Ross referred to as the Great Ice Age, 1919-31. through In self-righteousness, as well as in ideology, he was a progressive, a man of the left. Francis A. Walker was similarly prominent in the economics profession of his day. He was the first president of the American Economic Association, and the Francis A. Walker Medal, created in 1947, was the highest award given by the American Economics Association until 1977, when it was discontinued as a result of the creation of a Nobel Prize in economics. Professor Walker was also General Walker in the Union Army during the Civil War. He was, at various times, also president of the American Statistical Association and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was also in charge of the Ninth and Tenth Censuses of the United States, a commissioner of Indian Affairs, and was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. After Walker's death in 1897, Commemorative articles appeared in the Scholarly Journal of the American Statistical Association, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the first scholarly journal of the economics profession in the United States, published at Harvard, as well as in the Journal of Political Economy, published at the University of Chicago, and an obituary also appeared in the Economic Journal, England's premier scholarly journal of the economics profession. Richard T. Ely received his Ph.D. summa cum laude from the University of Heidelberg and was the author of many books, one of which sold more than a million copies. Among the prominent people who were his students were the already mentioned Edward A. Ross and Woodrow Wilson, both of whom studied under him at Johns Hopkins University. He was also considered a major contributing force in making the University of Wisconsin a vital institution wielding a profound influence upon the political economy of the state and the nation. Ely has been called the father of institutional economics, the field in which one of his students, John R. Commons, made his name at the University of Wisconsin. Richard T. Ely's death in 1943 was marked by tributes on both sides of the Atlantic, including an obituary in Britain's economic journal. On into the 21st century, one of the honors awarded annually by the American Economic Association to a distinguished economist has been an invitation to give the association's Richard T. Ely lecture. In short, Edward A. Ross, Francis A. Walker, and Richard T. Ely were not only in the mainstream, to use a term that has become common in our times, 
They were among the elite of the mainstream. But that was no more indication of the validity of what they said than it is among today's elite of the mainstream. While Madison Grant was not an academic scholar, he moved among prominent members of the intelligentsia. His closest friends included George Bird Grinnell, editor of the elite sportsman's magazine Forest and Stream, and Henry Fairfield Osborne, a world-renowned paleontologist who coined the term Tyrannosaurus rex. Osborne said, in the wake of mass mental testing, We have learned once and for all that the Negro is not like us. In short, Madison Grant, Edward A. Ross, Francis A. Walker, and Richard T. Ely were part of the intellectual currents of the times, in an era when leading intellectuals saw mental test results as confirming innate racial differences, when immigration was severely restricted for racial reasons, and when the Ku Klux Klan was revived and spread beyond the South, becoming an especially strong political force in the Midwest. As even a critical biographer of Madison Grant said, Grant was not an evil man. He did not wake up in the morning and think to himself, Hmm, I wonder what vile deeds I can commit today. To the contrary, he was by all accounts a sweet, considerate, erudite, and infinitely charming figure. Madison Grant also moved in socially elite and politically progressive circles. Theodore Roosevelt welcomed Grant's entry into an exclusive social club that T.R. had founded. Later, Grant became friends for a time with Franklin D. Roosevelt, addressing him in letters as My Dear Frank, while FDR reciprocated by addressing him as My Dear Madison. The two men met while serving on a commission as civic-minded citizens, and the fact that both suffered crippling illnesses during the 1920s created a personal bond. But Madison Grant's ideas moved far beyond such genteel circles in America. They were avidly seized upon in Nazi Germany, though Grant's death in 1937 spared him from learning of the ultimate consequences of such ideas, which culminated in the Holocaust. George Horace Lorimer, longtime editor of the Saturday Evening Post, was another major supporter of the progressive movement in the early 20th century, and his magazine, with a readership of four to five million readers per week, carried weight politically and socially. He supported both Theodore Roosevelt and progressive Senator Albert Beveridge. In proposing immigration restrictions, Lorimer, like many others of that era, invoked science as opposed to the Pollyanna school. In an editorial in the Saturday Evening Post, Lorimer warned against our racial degeneration as a result of immigration which he said could end with Americans having to forfeit our high estate and join the lowly ranks of the mongrel races. In the early 1920s, Lorimer assigned novelist and future Pulitzer Prize winner Kenneth L. Roberts to write a series of articles on immigration for the Saturday Evening Post. In one of these articles, Roberts referred to the better-class Northern and Western Europeans, who are particularly fine types of immigrants, as contrasted with the queer, alien, mongrelized people of southeastern Europe. These articles were later republished as a book titled Why Europe Leaves Home. In this book, Robert said, among other things, the Jews of Poland are human parasites, that people from the Austro-Hungarian Empire were inconceivably backward. He added, The American nation was founded and developed by the Nordic race, but if a few more million members of the Alpine, Mediterranean, and Semitic races are poured among us, the result must inevitably be a hybrid race of people as worthless and futile as the good-for-nothing mongrels of Central America and Southeastern Europe. Like many others of that era, Roberts invoked the notion of a scientific approach to immigration law while contrasting the desirable immigrants from northwestern Europe with the undesirables, who came from southern and eastern European countries. Progressive muckraking journalist George Creel, a former member of Woodrow Wilson's administration, wrote articles on immigration in 1921 and 1922 in Collier's Magazine, another leading mass circulation publication of that era. In these articles, he made the familiar contrast between the peoples of Northern and Western Europe with the people of Eastern and Southern Europe, using the familiar nomenclature of that time, which called the former Nordics and the latter Alpine and Mediterranean peoples. 
The men and women who first came to America were Nordic, clean-blooded, strong-limbed people from England, Ireland, Scotland, Scandinavia, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and France. The millions that followed them, for a full two centuries, were also Nordic, holding the same customs, ideas, and ideals, fitting into the life they found as skin fits the hand. Not until 1880 was there any vital change in the character of immigration, and then commenced the tidal waves of two new stocks, the Alpine from Central Europe, Slavs for the most part, and the Mediterranean, the small swarthy peoples from southern Italy, Greece, Spain, and northern Africa. These latter immigrants, Creel described as the failures, unfits, and misfits of the old world. Creel said, those coming from Eastern Europe were morally, physically, and mentally the worst in the history of immigration. While H. L. Mencken was another prominent intellectual during the Progressive Era, he was by no means a progressive. Yet his view of blacks was very much like that of other intellectuals of the times. Writing in 1908, he wrote of the hopelessly futile and fatuous effort to improve the Negroes of the southern United States by education. He added, It is apparent, on brief reflection, that the Negro, no matter how much he is educated, must remain, as a race, in a condition of subservience, that he must remain the inferior of the stronger and more intelligent white man so long as he retains racial differentiation. Therefore, the effort to educate him has awakened in his mind ambitions and aspirations which, in the very nature of things, must go unrealized. And so, while gaining nothing whatever materially, he has lost all his old contentment, peace of mind, and happiness. Indeed, it is a commonplace of observation in the United States that the educated and refined Negro is invariably a hopeless, melancholy, embittered, and despairing man. Similar views of blacks were expressed in other early writings by H. L. Mencken though blacks were not the only group viewed negatively in those writings. The Negro loafer is not a victim of restricted opportunity and oppression. There are schools for him, and there is work for him, and he disdains both. That his forty-odd years of freedom have given him too little opportunity to show his mettle is a mere theory of the chair. As a matter of fact, the Negro in the mass seems to be going backward. The most complimentary thing that can be said of an individual of the race today is that he is as industrious and honest a man as his grandfather, who was a slave. There are exceptional Negroes of intelligence and ability, I am well aware, just as there are miraculous Russian Jews who do not live in filth. But the great bulk of the race is made up of inefficients. However, by 1926 H. L. Mencken had changed his position somewhat. In a review of a book of essays by leading black intellectuals, edited by Alan Locke, himself a leading black intellectual of the times, Mencken wrote, This book, it seems to me, is a phenomenon of immense significance. What it represents is the American Negro's final emancipation from his inferiority complex, his bold decision to go it alone. That inferiority complex, until very recently, conditioned all of his thinking even, and perhaps especially, when he was bellowing most vociferously for his God-given rights. As I have said, go read the book, and having read it, ask yourself the simple question, could you imagine a posse of white Southerners doing anything so dignified, so dispassionate, so striking? As one who knows the South better than most, and has had contact with most of its intellectuals, real and confederate, I must say frankly, that I can imagine no such thing. Here, indeed, the Negro challenges the white Southerner on a common ground and beats him hands down. Yet Mencken was by no means sanguine about the prospects of the black population as a whole. The vast majority of the people of their race are but two or three inches removed from gorillas. It will be a sheer impossibility for a long, long while to interest them in anything above pork chops and bootleg gin. Like many other intellectuals of the early twentieth century, H. L. Mencken in 1937 favored eugenics measures, 
in this case voluntary sterilization of males, encouraged by rewards to be supplied by private philanthropy. As in the past, he included white Southerners among those considered undesirable. He suggested that the answers to many social problems would be to sterilize large numbers of American freemen, both white and black, to the end that they could no longer beget their kind. For this, the readiest way to induce them to submit would be to indemnify them in cash. The alternative, he said, would be supporting an ever-increasing herd of morons for all eternity. Not all eugenicists were racial determinists, as Mencken's inclusion of white Southerners in his eugenics agenda in 1937 indicated. In England, H. G. Wells rejected the singling out of particular races for extinction, though he recommended that undesirable people of whatever race be targeted. Writing in 1916, Wells said, Now I am a writer rather prejudiced against the idea of nationality. My habit of thought is cosmopolitan. I hate and despise a shrewish suspicion of foreigners and foreign ways. A man who can look me in the face, laugh with me, speak truth, and deal fairly, is my brother, though his skin is as black as ink or as yellow as an evening primrose. American novelist and radical Jack London, however, declared, The Anglo-Saxon is a race of mastery and is best fitted for survival. He said, The inferior races must undergo destruction, or some humane form of economic slavery is inevitable. While Jack London was a man of the left during the Progressive Era, he was not a progressive. He boldly declared himself a socialist. In 